Good morning, Graceville Church. Man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Are you excited to hear from the Word of God today? Man, there is something so good about gathering together. I loved on our social media yesterday, Hebrews was, qu- was quoted under our invite for today that we do not neglect meeting together because there is something that happens when we gather and we encourage one another, when we look at the word of God and we allow it to speak to our hearts. So before we begin today, I just want to start this way, if you would with me, if you will just open your hands to the Lord, just where you are right now, maybe you want to close your eyes and I want you to say this, Lord, Say it with me. Say, Lord, prepare my heart to hear your word today. My heart is open. I'm listening. Awesome. Will you turn to uh, the Bible with me to 2 Corinthians 8? That's where we're going to be today. We've been in this series called Heart of Generosity. Has it been encouraging to you, those of you that have been coming? It's, a, it's been encouraging to look at what the Word says about generosity. And we're going to go a little deeper today in the thought of what are the signs of a heart of generosity. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians 8. We're going to read the first five verses of this chapter. It says this, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. Now, the writer of 2 Corinthians is Paul, and he's writing to the church in Corinth here. And before we dive into the text fully, I think it's really important to give some context to what is going on here, to understand why Paul would be talking to the Corinthian church about this body of believers in Macedonia. What was the Macedonian church actually being generous to? The churches of Macedonia and the churches of Achaia, which would be where the Corinthian church was, were Gentile churches that had been planted by the founding church in Jerusalem. And the churches of Macedonia and Achaia were recipients of this idea that we see Jesus talk about in Matthew 28 when he said to his disciples, go into all the earth and preach the gospel. That's exactly what happened. At this time in history, the church in Jerusalem is struggling severely. And there are a few different factors that have taken place that has brought them into such affliction. There is a famine in the land that's causing severe hunger. They're facing intense persecution. And many of them have lost their jobs simply because of their faith in Jesus. Theologians write about this time in history that the temple in Jerusalem would have been a place of a lot of employment for a lot of people. This would be a place where a lot of Jews that had put their faith in Jesus would be employed. And at that time, the temple was controlled by a group of people called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were the upper class people of the day. And the thing about the Sadducees is that they did not believe in resurrection. So when you have a Jewish person that puts their faith in Jesus and is sharing the gospel of Jesus, what is the gospel of Jesus rooted in? Resurrection. It's rooted in Jesus' resurrection. And so because of this, many, many believers in Jerusalem had lost their jobs, had lost their income. And so their very way of buying food, having shelter, providing for their family was completely taken away. And they are struggling. And Paul is going out to these churches, to these Gentile churches who have received the spiritual blessings of the founding church. And he's saying, hey, everyone, we've got to gather together. We've got to help them. 
We see that Paul, this is such a burden of his that he writes about it over a lot of different of his writings of this collection that he's taken for the Jerusalem church. He talks to the Corinthians. He talks to the Macedonians. He even talks to the believers in Rome in chapter 15 when he says, for if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share in the material blessings that they've been given. So Paul is going out and telling these Gentile churches, hey, they need our help. We've got to gather together. We've got to participate. We need to walk in generosity. Now, it wasn't a way to make the Corinthian church feel bad that Paul is presenting this testimony of the Macedonian church. I mean, don't you absolutely love when you hear a testimony of the goodness of God? What does it do to your heart? It stirs your faith, doesn't it? And so Paul is not attempting to make the, the Corinthians feel bad. Rather, he is trying to spur them towards generosity. That's what Paul is doing here. And as we look at what Paul has to say about the Macedonians, this precious body of believers that are walking in a supernatural generosity, I think there's some things we really need to look at that we can learn from these people. Listen, my heart longs to walk in greater generosity. Ryan and I, as we talk about Grace Hill, as we pray about Grace Hill, our heart is that Grace Hill would be a generous people. And we are, but we want to go further in our generosity. And so today, I want us to look at the Macedonian church as an example. And I want us to look at what are the signs of a generous heart. First in your notes today, if you're taking them, Generosity is a signal. Generosity is a signal. Look at verse 1 and 2 again in chapter 8. It says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Paul says, We want you to know about this grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. He uses the word grace concerning their generosity a few times in this chapter. He says, we want you to know about the grace God has given in verse 1. In verse 6, he says, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. And then in verse 7, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. The word grace in the New Testament is a word we've all heard many times. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? And the grace of God in the terms of us receiving God's grace that covers our sins means unmerited favor and unmerited favor and unmerited grace. But here, this grace that Paul is talking about means favor shown because of favor received. The grace that he's talking about here is because of favor shown, because of favor received. I have received grace, therefore I want to be gracious to others. In other words, generosity is a proof or it is a signal that God has been working his grace in a person's heart. We on our own, and I think you would agree with me, are not genuinely generous. Would you agree with me? On our own, in our own ability, a sinful nature is a selfish nature. A sinful nature does not bend towards genuine kingdom generosity. A sinful nature wants the credit. It wants recognition or return. But generosity in God's terms is very different. And I would say most likely generosity for us on our own does not come naturally. I'll be honest with you, in my own ability, me, Lauren, in my own ability, I'm not a naturally generous person when it comes to money. It's not something that comes naturally to me. And I, I think we can all agree that the way we view money is probably rooted from how we viewed it as a child. Some of you in the room never had to think about money because it just, there was never need. Maybe you're like my kids when they were little and we had to teach them that the debit card was not in fact magical. I can remember when they were little and they would say, oh, I want that mom, just use the card. 
So we had to teach them, it's not magical, it doesn't work. I mean, wouldn't we all love that? Come on, money growing on trees, that's the real, that's it right there. Not magical, right? But because they didn't have to think about money, there was a framework, there was a freedom, it, no worries. But for some of you in the room, it was very different. There was a different framework amount of money because you always felt the need. You felt the tension. You felt the weight of it. I know for me, there was a framework of fear that was put around money as a young child. And a framework of fear began to create a grip for me when it came to generosity. I naturally, in my own ability, because of the view that had been created, not by God, but by me allowing fear to have a voice in my generosity, it created a framework and a boundary. And so naturally, I begin to hold on tighter. I could be generous in so many ways. I could be generous with my talents. I could be generous with my abilities for the Lord. I could be generous with friendships. I can be generous with helping people. But if it came to money, I might look generous, but my heart was plagued with fear. My heart was plagued with worry. And Ryan can attest to this. There was a time where God began to work. Aren't you thankful for God? Aren't you thankful that he doesn't quit? He just keeps working. He just keeps chipping away at our heart. And he began to reveal to me the fear, the grip, the worry. And I began to see things. It's as if my eyes begin to get clear. And as I begin to let the Lord work in my heart, as I begin to release the grip, the fear of what if, what if, control, control, lack of trust, I begin to walk in generosity. And can I tell you, I started to experience joy and peace that I've never known. It was no longer me walking in what appeared to be generosity, but then inside I'm having this anxiety and fear. Rather, there was this overflow of joy. This overflow of trust. And can I tell you, my husband can attest to it, it was a signal of God's grace at work in my heart. This is not something we do in our own ability. This is that grace that Paul is talking about. He's telling the Corinthian church, you can see it in them. You can see it in them. Listen, a heart of generosity does not walk in obligation. A heart of generosity does not walk in obligation. And this is a gradual work of the Holy Spirit. And hear me, in me, it still is today. He's working, he's stretching, he's asking for more because it's this gradual work of the Holy Spirit. It's this whole idea that 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, when it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. The new is here. When we are in Christ, our hearts will change and continue to change. Our hearts will change. Oh, but they will continue to change. New creation, new cre change. It's in the heart. And when we begin to lean towards this heart shift, when it comes to generosity, there will be a signal that God is at work in you. Because generosity is a signal. A heart of generosity will be a witness of God's goodness and faithfulness to those who believe, but also to those who don't believe. What do we see the signal that God has been working in the church in Macedonia? Look at verse 2. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Wait, did you catch that? The Macedonian church was fa facing a severe trial and extreme poverty. And yet they had overflowing joy that resulted in rich generosity. This is definitely the work of God in them. Do you see the signal of God working? They are extremely poor, facing severe trials, and yet rich generosity. Come on, this is challenging. Because I can honestly tell you right now, if I'm in their situation, I don't know. Would I swell up in rich generosity? 
I've never faced extreme poverty. I've never faced intense persecution. But I know in my own ability and my selfless nature, those things would not spur me toward rich generosity. It has to be a work of God in our hearts. This was not in their own doing. Hear me, this was not in their own ability. God had given them a grace. And he filled them with their joy because they were allowing the Lord to work on their heart. I love this quote by Warren Wiersbe concerning this. He says this about the Macedonian church. Their giving was voluntary and unforced. It was a, of grace and not pressure. They gave because they wanted to give and because they had experienced the grace of God. Listen to this. Grace not only frees us from our sins, but it frees us from ourselves. The grace of God will open your heart and your hand. Your giving is not the result of cold calculation, but of warm-hearted jubilation. Listen, as we draw nearer and nearer to the Lord, he will begin to create in us a heart of generosity and it will be a signal to believers and unbelievers because when God is at work in us and we begin to allow him to cultivate this heart of generosity, can I tell you something? Overflowing joy will be the sound on your lips. Overflowing joy will be on your countenance. It's not you, it's the Lord. The Macedonians had experienced the grace of God, even in severe trials, and they were walking in generosity because of it. And Paul is telling the Corinthian church, listen, you can see it. You can see the work of God in them. So first, we learn that generosity is a signal, but secondly, we learn this from them. Generosity is a privilege. Verse 3 in 4, it says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. These Macedonian believers, they didn't see generosity as a burden to bear, but rather a privilege to be a part of. We know, and we've talked about this through this series a lot, that everything belongs to the Lord. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. And he's given us the opportunity to be stewards of what he has given. That includes our finances. And when we live our lives with us in control, when we are not letting the Lord lead our lives, lead us when it comes to generosity, we can view giving as a burden. But there's a shift that begins to happen when we allow the Lord to work on our hearts. What once seemed as a burden now is an opportunity. What once seemed like a burden now seems like an opportunity to partner with the Lord, to partner with his kingdom. So we go from burden to privilege. It's a hard shift. It's a trusting in the Lord. And this is the type of generosity the Macedonians were walking in. We're talking about this heart of generosity. It's a heart change. It's a, it's a mind shift. I love the scripture we've talked about. I preached on it recently here about the mindset that we need to take, renewing the mind, taking on the Lord's mindset, allowing us to have his heart. And the Lord, who is the most generous of anyone, what a generous God we have. Think about John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave he gave the most generous act when he went to the cross for you and for me and he made a way for us to have eternity with him is there greater generosity he's so generous it's in his nature and our desire should be to be more and more like him in this way even in our giving it's a heart shift and when this happens generosity goes from feeling like a burden to now what a privilege God, what an opportunity. What a privilege to honor your name, to bless your name with my generosity. Notice something about 
what Paul says about the response of these people when it came to giving to the Jerusalem church. He says in verse four, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing to the Lord's people. The Jerusalem church was extremely poor. We've established that. But history shows us that the Macedonians were also very poor. Scripture even tells us extreme poverty. Now, I don't know, was the Jerusalem church, were they, were they in worse shape than the Macedonians? I don't know. But we, what we know is that both of them are facing affliction. The fact that the scripture tells us that the Macedonians urgently pleaded with Paul tells me that it's quite possible that Paul might have seen their own trials and said, hey, it's okay. It's okay. I see that you're struggling too. Can I be honest? I'm the same way. If I see, some, if I see someone struggling, it's okay. It's okay. But what did the Macedonians do? They said, no. No, we have to be a part of this. They pleaded. They begged, Paul, no, listen to us. God has spoken. God has spoken. We've got to be a part of this. We've got to walk in generosity. They clearly know that God, God's word is greater than Paul's. They know the joy that comes from generosity. They see the privilege as something that they want to be a part of. And when we see generosity as a privilege to honor the Lord, to partner with his kingdom, and he speaks to us about something to give, we will have hearts that are like these believers that say, I've got to be a part of this. Oh, I see it, Lord. I hear your voice. I hear what you're saying. What a privilege to give to you. To see it not as a burden to bear, but a privilege to be a part of. It would have been really easy for the Macedonians to be like, Paul's given us a pass. I guess we don't need to do it. I mean, it's Paul. It's Paul. If he says it, maybe we don't have to be a part of it. But I believe God had spoken to their hearts what to give, and not even Paul could change their minds because it wasn't about impressing him or having other people look at them as some great group of people. It was only about the privilege and the honor of walking and generosity for God's purposes, even in the midst of their struggle. And I love that it says they gave as much as they were able and beyond their ability. Paul didn't ask them to give a certain amount. He presented the need and they responded. They responded with as much as they were able and even more because God was at work in their hearts and their genuine generosity was a signal of that, which allowed them to see it as a privilege. So we see that generosity is a signal, generosity is a privilege, and then finally generosity is sacrificial. Verse five, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Now, when I say generosity is sacrificial, immediately some of, your, some of you put up a stop sign and you said, oh, she's about to say, give all that I have. Not even close. Or maybe you've thought, oh man, she's gonna say, give till it hurts. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying here. When I say generosity is sacrificial, what I'm meaning here is we need to live with our hands open to the Lord to say, God, you have me, which means you have all of me. That's including generosity. That's including my finances, Lord. Because generosity is being a living sacrifice to the Lord that says, God, you have my yes. God, you have my yes. Paul tells the Corinthians that this church gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. They gave themselves first to the Lord. That's the starting point. 
Generosity comes first from giving ourselves to the Lord. This is a daily decision. Giving ourselves to him daily. And it's something that grows and it's something that matures in our walk with the Lord. It's a heart posture. A heart posture that's coming to the Lord over and over. God, my hands are open. Lord, you have my yes. Lord, what are you asking me to be generous to? What are you asking me to give? And when we come to him, when we walk with him, we will hear him more clearly and our own thoughts and emotions frameworks of fear will not get in the way of our generosity. It won't get in the way. And in that, our generosity becomes sacrificial. The thing we need to understand is that God will ask all of us to be generous in some way. He will ask us to be generous in some way. He will speak to us he will stretch us as we walk with him. But let me assure you of something today. He will always be faithful. He will always be faithful. He speaks, we listen. Our generosity is tied to our obedience. He speaks, we listen. Now, as you study 2 Corinthians in this portion of scripture, you'll discover that partly why Paul is testifying of the Macedonian generosity to the Corinthian church and their response to the Lord is because the Corinthian church just a year prior had committed to an amount to give and they had not come through on their promise. Now you're sitting there and thinking, wait, is Paul just guilt tripping this church into giving what they said? No, not guilt tripping at all but rather encouraging them to remember the faithfulness of God, to encourage them to step into the generosity that God had spoken. Remember, Paul had not given an amount. Paul had not given an amount to anyone. God had spoken and they had determined in their heart what God had said to give, but they had not come through on their promise yet. Corinthians 9, 7, Paul is still talking to the Corinthian church and he says to them, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The Corinthian church no doubt was able to give more than the Macedonians. They were not impoverished as the Macedonians were. And maybe at this point, the Corinthian church, as far as an amount, had given more than the Macedonians. But church, can I assure you about something? It's not about being wealthy. It's not about being poor. It's not about being somewhere in between. God has given each of us something to steward. And it's not about who gives more and who gives less. God is concerned about your obedience. God is concerned about your obedience. What is he asking you? He wants to use all of us for his kingdom. What a privilege. What an honor. There were wealthy people in the Bible. We've read about the impoverished, but there were wealthy people in the Bible. Abraham, wealthy many hundreds of employees, hundreds of flocks and herds. He was a wealthy man. Joseph, who was arguably the second wealthiest person with his time on earth, God, not Joseph, had put him in a place of leadership that came with wealth. But these men were were God-fearing, obedient men who said, God, you've given me something to steward. I respond to what you say. It's not about wealthy poor or somewhere in between. What is God saying? We listen. Paul says of the Macedonians, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. They sought God's wisdom and followed his will for them. And seeking his wisdom comes from a daily surrender. It's a daily decision. It's laying down what I'm comfortable doing to say yes to what God is asking me to do. 
It's that whole thought that I love that Ryan has said a couple times. The difference between what I'm comfortable giving and what God is asking me to give, it's transformation. It's transformation. Does God want us to be smart and save our money and be wise with our money? Yes, there are scriptures to support that. But he also calls us to be generous, to listen to his voice, to not act out of compulsion, but to seek his wisdom and follow him in generosity. Notice what the scripture says that we read a moment ago in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. 7. God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful in the Greek is the word hilaros, which is also translated as not begrudgingly, which is where I was at times when God was working on my heart, but with a gracious attitude. A cheerful giver, a giver with a gracious attitude comes from a heart that is leaning towards generosity. And what do we know that scripture tells us that God looks at? What, is he, what are his eyes on? First Samuel 16, 7 says, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. How we walk in generosity with a gracious attitude comes from the heart. And generosity has to become sacrificial, living open-handed to the Lord. And when we do that, God works on our hearts. And that's what his eyes are on. It doesn't matter what it looks like to anybody else. God is looking at your heart. He's looking at your heart and he wants to work on it because generosity will then become sacrificial. And you will give with a cheerful, gracious heart that says, Lord, I'm yours. You have my yes. I'll invite Max up with me. I think it's apparent and we see it together that this type of generosity is what we're seeing in the Macedonians. They didn't have much and yet they gave all that God had spoken to them to give with overflowing joy. That is generosity that pleases the heart of the Father. And this can only come through open hands to him daily. Church, he wants your heart. He wants your heart. And generosity can be one of those pieces of our heart that we struggle to come through on because of our lack of trust. Because of our desire for control. Any control freaks, recovering control freaks in the room, please raise your hand with me. 100% right here. You can ask my husband. You know, our lives are way better in his hands than our own. Giving him control, allowing him to work on our hearts, releases things. You know, it's interesting when I think about it, and this is in my mind in my notes, but I feel like the Lord is speaking. For someone like me that has walked in fear from as a child, so afraid. I could feel the tension around money. As God began to speak to me, I felt like he was saying, Lauren, I've given you a key (laughs) and you're just holding it. When I tell you the grip on that key was so tight, it was as if a vice was holding it. And I feel like the Lord is wanting to speak to some of you today. You're holding on so tight, but you actually are holding a key that will unlock a door of freedom. You're actually holding a key that if you will use it for my purposes, joy is going to rain down. Blessing and favor is going to rain down. 
not always in money ways. Listen, there's so much greater blessings and joy that come from the Lord besides money. Joy unspeakable, peace that passes all understanding of the heart and mind only found in Jesus. You're not going to find it anywhere else. Last October, we weren't even for sure that we were going to be in this series. And I, I see the hand of God working on me then, even for this moment. Isn't he good? I was coming home from an event that I was a part of in South Dallas. And it was uh, traffic time. <laughs> And so living in Dallas now for the last almost six years, I've learned most of the time, not always, I'm not going to give her all the credit, Siri's smarter than me, when it comes to getting me home during traffic. And there's different avenues sometimes that she'll take because of an accident or something going on. And so I had punched in my address, not that I didn't know how to get home, but she knew the better way that day. So I'm coming down 75 and she tells me to turn onto Mockingbird. Now, I always have a million things on my mind. So I'm driving home and I'm like, oh my word, we don't have groceries. Like, like someone said the other day, and I totally agree. I was like, man, when I got married, I didn't realize, like, I have to think about what people eat every day. This is like the torment of my life. What am I going to feed the the people? So I'm in my normal mindset. Oh Lord, the mouths are hungry. Like I got to figure this out. Well, my normal grocery store is this Kroger down here. We're praying for it. It's going to do work. You know what? I'm making friends. Let me tell you, I'm making friends. But I got on Mockingbird, and I see in the corner of my eye, there's a Kroger right there. And I've been in that Kroger before, but I thought, man, maybe I should just go to my normal one. I know my grocery store like the back of my hand. You know how that goes. But something in me said, turn. So I got in the turning lane. And I turn into this Kroger. And as I'm pulling in, I can see at the front door, just off to the right-hand side, there is a homeless man, and he's sleeping on the sidewalk, right in front of the entrance. And I felt the Spirit of God speak to me and say, go buy him a sandwich. Okay, Lord, absolutely, I'll do that. I'll buy a Gatorade too. Brownie points, I'm just kidding. I'm a recovering pleaser, let me tell you. So I go inside, and here's the thing you got to know about me. Some of you heard me talk about this. I am like the world's biggest bargain deal finder. It's who I am. There's a lot tied to that. There's a lot of childhood stuff tied to that, but it's like, oh, there's a better deal. There's a better deal, okay? I'm not going to rest till I find the better deal. So I go in the grocery store and I have that mindset on my mind and I go over to the sandwiches and in my mind, I'm like, okay, what's the best deal? And I felt the spirit of God speak to me in my heart and say, buy the most expensive sandwich you can find. Okay, God, all right. So I go over to the boar's head because that's like the name brand, okay? I'm like, give me that market pantry, okay? No, I'm just kidding, that's Walmart. But I go over to Boar's Head and I find this huge, expensive, like I wouldn't buy this for my children, okay? Expensive sandwich. And I grab it and I say, okay, Lord. So I go over and I buy it and I buy a drink. And I walk outside and he's gone. I became like the mall fast walkers, okay? I booked it to my car. I jumped in my car. I drove everywhere. I drove around the building. I drove behind the building next. I drove down the street. I'm driving. I'm weaving through the parking lot. Where is this man? And I said, God, I said it out loud in my car. God, why would you have me do that? He's gone. And I felt the spirit of God speak to my heart. And he said, I needed to know I had your yes. I was just checking. Did I have your yes, Lauren? Even in the detail of buy the most expensive sandwich, it's not in your nature, Lauren. It's not in your nature to be generous in your own ability, 
Can I tell you, in that moment, I begin to weep. I'm in my car and I'm weeping. And I just kept saying, God, you have my yes. You have my yes. You have my yes now. In the next detail, you have my yes because my life in your hands is greater than it is in mine. Church, listen to me. God has given you a key to unlock something in your heart when you say yes to that step of generosity. When you say yes to that detail that he's asking you to give. He wants your yes. And listen, God has, God has given for Ryan and I, when we prayed about being a church of generosity, he's given us vision and hearts for what we can be a part of. And there's going to be needs presented to you. Needs like Project Rescue that we've talked about before that Ryan and I had the privilege and the honor of going and seeing and walking into brothels and being a part of seeing women that are enslaved into sex trafficking and this, this God-filled, spirit-led organization that is going in and saving women and rewriting their story. What a privilege to be a part of. We have a goal to give $10,000 to Project Rescue this year. I think it's too small. I think it's too small. We have missionaries around the world right now. We have missionaries that are giving their lives for the gospel of Jesus. What a privilege that we get to walk in generosity, to continue the work, to spread the gospel. And hear me, there will be things that we know that our generosity touches and we will celebrate that. There will be things we know about, but guess what? There will be lives, there will be generations that are changed by our generosity that we will never know of, but God does. God does, and we celebrate the known and the unknown. Because here what, here's what we know. Our God is a God of the impossible. So what we give, he stretches. Thanks to the loaves and the fishes. It was small. What did he do? Multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. What would God do with your generosity? What would God do if you leaned in to a heart of generosity? I believe right now God is speaking to some of you. I know he's speaking to me. I know that he's saying, Lauren, you've released the grip a little bit, but there's more to give. What would God do with a church like the Macedonians that said, no, we've got to be a part of it. What more could we say yes to if we took a step further and we experienced that overflowing of joy? What would God do? Today, as we end, I really want to end the way we began. If you would stand with me, we're just going to take a moment and we're going to create a heart posture to the Lord that says, God, my hands are open. My heart is open. You have my yes. So all over the room right now, would you just close your eyes? And just in your own words, maybe just a whisper, I want you to tell the Lord. Maybe he's stirring your heart right now and you just need to say, God, you have my yes. You have my yes now. You have my yes tomorrow. You have my yes for the years to come. And Lord, I know that you're faithful from generation to generation. So Lord, my yes is going to teach my children to say yes. You have my yes. Father, I pray that our hearts would be overwhelmed with, want others, with wanting others to know the grace that had been given to us through our generosity. Let it come from the overflow of our surrender to you. Lord, let our generosity be an act of worship. Let it please you, Lord, and honor you. Even at times when it may stretch us, Lord, help us to keep the right heart, heart posture to you, Lord. God, let the cry of our hearts be that we want to excel in the grace of giving. 
that we want to excel in the grace of generosity, that me, it may be a sign of your work in our hearts today and that we would see generosity as a privilege to partner with you, to honor you, to keep our focus where it needs to be. For Lord, it's for your glory, it's for your name. Come on, let's just sing this together. And oh, 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 you can have my heart. You can have my heart. It's yours, Lord. Oh, oh, oh you can have my heart. You can have my heart. Come on, sing it again. And oh, you can have my heart, it's yours. You can have my heart, Lord. Oh, oh, you can have my heart. You can have my heart. Father, we declare it's yours. you, Holy Spirit, that you continue to work on us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you continue to shed light on the parts that we haven't surrendered. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord. Help us daily, Lord, to lean closer to you, to draw nearer and nearer, to hear your voice as you speak to us. We love you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, isn't the Lord good? I pray, and I said this the last time, that the conversation doesn't stop here. I think I said this the last time I preached, there's some good conversations that are about to happen in the car on the way home. Holy Spirit-led conversations. Do not let this stay here, but let the Lord begin to swell something up inside your heart that a seed that was planted may grow. I pray that you're blessed today, that your week is blessed, your families are blessed, your children are blessed, and that you go in the joy and the favor of the Lord and that you come back next week because we want to see you here as we end out these series, this series. We love you. We're praying blessing over you. Go today. Hug somebody as you leave.